Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Landau. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about the generalized anxiety disorder. Now, anxiety in general can be an appropriate response to a stressful situation, but it's pathological when it's disabling and it's difficult to control. Generalized anxiety disorder is the most prevalent psychiatric illness in the country. Estimated 15 to 20 percent of people who see their physicians, generalized anxiety disorder may well be behind the problem. It's often misdiagnosed as depression, major depressive disorder, but interestingly, if you have generalized anxiety disorder, somewhere between 30 and 60 percent of people are also going to have coexisting major depressive disorder. For the most part, the conditions can be taken care of by the primary physician, the internist, the general practitioner. Generalized anxiety disorder is a subjective sense of unease and dread and foreboding. It's uncontrollable and persistent or unrealistic worry. It's associated with muscle tension and impaired concentration and arousal of the autonomic nervous system, so the heart rate is up. You feel like you're on edge or restless. People suffer from insomnia. You have excessive worry, restlessness, feel tired, irritable, sweat or tremble. You have headaches and gastrointestinal symptoms, very common have interpersonal problems. So you can see that generalized anxiety disorder often interferes with daily function. People are concerned about issues that involve their health and money and death and friendship problems. Symptoms tend to come and go. They wax and wane. And generalized anxiety disorder has to be differentiated between a psychiatric condition and a response to a medical abnormality. Now, unfortunately, the criteria for the diagnosis consistently change, and that makes determining some of the epidemiological factors about generalized anxiety disorder quite hard. So, 1980, the American Psychiatric Association, in their manual, it's called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, DSM, the third edition, they split anxiety neuroses into generalized anxiety disorder and panic symptoms more than a month. Have the increased rate of major depressive disorder. Then they revised the manual in 1987 and said now instead of one month you had to have these problems for six months and it was pathologic worry. That was the defining characteristic and it was present in multiple domains. So in other words it was present at school or at work or about your finances or about your health. Then 1994 they came out with another edition. Changed the definition. Now you have to have excessive worry and you have to have a number of physiological symptoms, and you have to have at least three of six specific symptoms in order to make the diagnosis. Then the DSM-5 came out more recently, and they say excessive worry more days than not, and the symptoms have to be at least six months, they have to be worry that's challenging to control, and it can shift from one topic to another. And again, you have to have at least three of six physical or cognitive symptoms. Well, what kind of symptoms make the diagnosis of generalized anxiety disorder? They're totally nonspecific. Now, even though I said you need at least three of six, if you're a child, you only need one. So, restlessness. Oh, come on. Restlessness or tire easily or difficulty concentrating or irritability or muscle tension or problems with your sleep. Now if you have at least three of those and they're severe enough to interfere with your daily function, then by definition you're suffering from the generalized anxiety disorder. But unfortunately a lot of people have physical symptoms and because they have physical symptoms the diagnosis tends to be delayed for oftentimes many years. And only about a third of the people with the condition receive the correct diagnosis. So, what do we know about generalized anxiety disorder accompaniments? Well, very frequently people who have generalized anxiety disorder misuse alcohol, they misuse substances, they have social anxiety disorder, they tend to smoke. Smoking is a risk for anxiety.
If you have too much coffee, that can make the anxiety symptoms even worse. And now the American Psychiatric Association differentiates different forms of anxiety. So we have the generalized anxiety disorder, we have social phobia, we have social anxiety disorder, we have panic disorder, we have agoraphobia. And remember, somewhere between 60 and 95 percent of people who have the generalized anxiety disorder have another psychiatric problem to boot. 30 to 60 percent of the time it's going to be major depressive disorder and we also find about the same number of people who have another anxiety disorder so frequently these anxiety disorders tend to run together. Generalized anxiety disorder tends to be more common in women than in men. Ratio of about two to one. It's said that poverty and sexual or physical abuse or discrimination tends to increase the incidence, but you don't have to have any of those precipitants to get the generalized anxiety disorder. In men, it tends to come on in the early 20s. Women tends to come on more in the late 20s. You have a peak prevalence somewhere around 40 to 60 years of age. It's common in elderly individuals and more common in African Americans than it is in Caucasians. Symptoms can begin as early as childhood or late adolescence. About 3% of the people who have the condition begins in childhood, 11% in adolescence. Most often though, it's in early adulthood over age 20 and then there's another peak in senior citizens who worried about some other kind of chronic medical condition. Generalized anxiety disorder tends to occur somewhat earlier than the other types of anxiety disorder I just mentioned, and the onset tends to be gradual. Now, most people seek care from the general practitioner, and as a matter of fact, if we look in general practitioner's office, five to six times as likely to have uh, generalized anxiety disorder. These patients tend to flock to doctor's offices and as a result they go to the emergency room, they go to the general practitioner, they go to the specialty clinics and the problem is that they don't think any of the doctors can diagnose them. They're dissatisfied and they're dissatisfied because they go with physical symptoms and those physical symptoms are diagnosed with kind of nebulous disorders but they haven't gotten to the underlying condition. The underlying condition isn't the medical disorder. The underlying condition is the suffering from generalized anxiety disorder. And these people have a higher incidence of suicide. And even if we set aside all the traditional risk factors and look at the people, it seems that they have a higher incidence of cardiovascular problems. So they have a higher incidence of angina and myocardial infarctions and mini strokes and strokes and death, perhaps due to the autonomic nervous system arousal. They also seem to have an increased risk of chronic obstructive lung disease and chronic pain syndromes and asthma and irritable bowel syndrome. And that's probably because they see more doctors and get more diagnoses. Now the question is, is generalized anxiety disorder different than major depressive disorder? Well, they very frequently coexist and they oftentimes share the same kinds of symptoms. So they share the symptoms of irritable mood and fatigue and insomnia and difficulty concentrating and sleeplessness. But people with depression tend to have anhedonia. Anhedonia, they don't get pleasure out of formerly pleasurable activities and they tend not to respond to the benzodiazepines. On the other hand, generalized anxiety disorder they don't have the hopelessness or anhedonia, they have helplessness. Well, if we look at the genetics, are genetics involved? Sure they're involved, they're involved in everything. It seems like they might account for as many as a third of all of those people who have generalized anxiety disorders. Studies have shown more than 200 genes are involved, but none of them seem to be major. So it seems like there's little contributor from a whole bunch of different kinds of genes. And if you inherit the appropriate genes and then you're put under stress for some reason, then you may well develop a higher incidence of generalized anxiety disorder. If a primary relative suffers the condition, you have about a six-fold increase in the incidence. And remember, it's now thought that generalized anxiety disorder and panic disorder migrate separately. They have different genetic backgrounds. 
where is the primary locus of abnormality seems to be the amygdala. The amygdala in the brain is where you process emotion and fear and anxiety and has connections to a whole bunch of other areas of the brain. It seems like if we're going to find a specific abnormality, it has to do with the GABA, the gamma amino butyric acid. And it seems that this particular substance, when it's present in abnormal amounts, well, those are the people who tend to develop the anxiety, and they also tend to develop panic, and it seems that the benzodiazepines quiet the whole thing down. Well, serotonin might be involved in that, might be why a medicine like buspirone seems to be effective. How do you screen for the condition? Well, that's not very easy. Uh, they have some screening tests, some simple questionnaires. One question is, are you bothered by your nerves? And that's a single screening uh, question that's very frequently used. And they also have a two-item test. Are you bothered by feeling nervous or anxious or on edge? And are you worried about not being able to control yourself? Are you worried about losing control? Have you had that symptom in the past two weeks? And then they increase the number of questions up to seven. And the response to the seven is supposedly determinant of whether you have generalized anxiety disorder or not. So they ask if you feel nervous or on edge. Do you have a problem about being able, not being able to stop worrying? Do you worry too much about different things? Do you have trouble relaxing? And do you have trouble with restlessness or just sitting still? Do you become easily annoyed or irritable? Do you feel afraid? You feel as if something awful might happen. That's the way you screen for a medical disease? Well, no wonder we have such a major problem, so much difference between one doctor and another on how anxiety or how any of these other disorders are diagnosed because we don't have any blood tests, we don't have any simple examinations, we can't do any imaging studies that are going to make the diagnosis. So it's questions like, how do you feel? Are you irritable? And then we grade irritability. Well, in addition to all of that, these symptoms have to interfere with the function, they have to interfere with your normal lifestyle, they can't be due to either another kind of a drug you're taking or a health problem that you have. They don't seem to fit better with panic disorder. So we look at the severity of the symptoms, whether you have the symptoms never or a little bit during the week or half of the time or all of the time and we give those numeric values and we add up all of the scores and then we say on the basis of that whether you have generalized anxiety disorder. Sounds kind of goofy to me. And ICD-10, that's the International Classification of Disease. So far we've been talking about the American Psychiatric Association where the International Classification of Disease sort of merges the generalized anxiety disorder with panic disorder. So they focus more on physiological arousal. Do you have sweating and palpitations and dizziness? Do you suffer from trembling? How about palpitations or accelerated heart rate? Do you have a dry mouth? And they also ask about other concerns. For instance, chest or abdominal pain or difficulty breathing or do you have a fear of choking? Do you have nausea or vomiting or do you have distress in your abdomen? Do you feel uneasy or faint or lightheaded? All of those are suggestive of both generalized anxiety disorder and to some extent panic. So they don't make such a big differentiation as we do here in the United States. And there are an awful lot of other symptoms that they include that we tend not to. But that's part of the reason why the diagnosis isn't made terribly frequently here because the people don't go to the doctor saying, hey, I'm worried. The people go to the doctor complaining about all these other things, the palpitations or the abdominal pain. Well, we know that you can get some kind of symptoms if you have hyperthyroidism, if you have certain organic neurologic diseases, if you're taking psychoactive drugs, maybe amphetamines, or if you've been taking the benzodiazepines or other drugs for a while and now you've discontinued them. 
we also have to exclude other kind of conditions, although that's kind of hard because, as I said, the generalized anxiety disorder tends to go along with a variety of other psychiatric abnormalities, but we tend to exclude or OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, panic disorder, hypochondriasis, post-traumatic stress disorder, and the chronic functional pain syndromes. Testing for generalized anxiety disorder really doesn't exist. You can do a blood count to rule out anemia, you check the thyroid function, do a urinalysis for drug screening, but that's pretty much it. Well, there's certain drugs that might make matters worse. So if you're taking the corticosteroids, prednisone drugs like that, if you're using the sympathomimetic amines, drugs like you might use to clear up a stuffed nose, the phenylephrine, even some herbal supplements like ginseng might cause some people to become anxious. There's alcohol, obviously, and getting off of the benzodiazepines might cause similar kind of symptoms. Now, this is one of those conditions where there's an impact due to the language and the culture and the race and the ethnicity and the religion and the geographic origin of the people. So what we consider abnormal over in China or over in Germany or over in areas of Africa might be considered perfectly normal. Well, unfortunately, most of the people are diagnosed by the general practitioner as having one disease, one disorder where we just said that almost everybody has multitude of disorders and that's one of the reasons why when you take one pill you might not get better because you're suffering from several different kind of medical or psychiatric issues. So if you're seen by the general practitioner and you don't seem to be getting better with taking a pill then maybe it's time to see a psychiatrist. The remission rate if you suffer from the condition is about 50 percent over a period of about a decade but the relapse rate is about 40%. Now, how do we treat generalized anxiety disorder? Well, there are the common thoughts that you should avoid excess caffeine and nicotine and alcohol, do some relaxation exercises and deep breathing, maybe meditation, maybe change your diet somehow, increase some of the anti-inflammatory foods like salmon because that contains a lot of the omega-3 fish oils try to manage your stress, get enough sleep, get enough exercise. Well, there's cognitive behavioral therapy. That's especially good if a person's suffering from substance abuse. But that tends not to be nearly as helpful in anxiety as it might be in depression. About a third of the patients are going to be helped, a third of the patients not going to be helped, and about a third of the patients are going to receive a little bit of help. You can even get some of the CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, over the internet or the smartphone. There are some other kind of therapies like relaxation response therapy or progressive muscle relaxation that help some people. Then we have the medicines. And right now, it seems in the United States, the SSRIs, the Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors, drugs like Prozac and Zoloft and Paxil, those seem to be very commonly used. Now, how effective they are, that remains to be seen. The response rate's probably only 30 to 50 percent, and that's even looking at the published studies, but there's publication bias and reporting bias because you have to remember the drug companies sponsor a lot of the studies. So those numbers, 30-50% response, might be extraordinarily high. Now, not only do we have the SSRIs, we have the SNRIs, drugs like Cymbalta and Effexor. Well, they have a similar response to the SSRIs, but they might be less tolerable might have more side effects, more anxiety and restlessness and uh, problem with insomnia and dizziness and sweating, sexual dysfunction might come on more with them than with uh, SSRIs. There's a serotonin syndrome that also could develop with any of those drugs that I just mentioned. And the serotonin syndrome, if you think you had a problem with anxiety, generalized anxiety disorder, you really have a problem if the serotonin syndrome 
develops. That's agitation and restlessness, confusion and hypertension and problem with muscle rigidity and sweating and diarrhea and headache and arrhythmias. Well, if you're going to take any of the medicines, you begin with a low dose to start. If you're not better by about eight weeks, not significantly improved by about eight weeks, then you can switch to another drug, even in the same class, the benzodiazepines. They're very popular. They're the most often prescribed drug. They're for really short-term relief. Now, if you take them for a long period of time, there's a problem with physiological and physical dependence to the drug, and there also is the possibility of impaired cognition and motor function. In other words, it can make you a little daffy in your head and can make it very difficult to drive a car safely or operate heavy machinery. Maybe you're not going to be as alert at school or at work. Maybe if you're an elderly individual, you have an increased incidence of falls and fractures. So if you're going to take the benzodiazepines, it might be a good idea to take them for just two to four weeks while the other medicines supposedly kick in. If you're going to take the benzodiazepines, you have to realize that their difference in the half-life, and, and if you're interested in any of these drugs, the SSRIs or the SNRIs or the benzodiazepines, we have shows on each of them specifically. But the benzodiazepines, we have the short half-life, drugs like alprazolam or Xanax, lorazepam or Ativan, oxazepam. We have the long half-life, those are drugs like diazepine and, or Valium. Well, they're not really recommended by the national organizations, by the international organizations, because of the potential for tolerance and the psychomotor impairment that we mentioned. But they really do seem to work pretty well if people have generalized anxiety disorder, and they probably work a lot better than the SSRIs that are being pushed right now. If you're taking the benzodiazepines, you do try to take a relatively short course because of the problem I just mentioned. Be, have, be very careful if you're taking alcohol with them. Second line therapy might be drugs like buspirone or Lyrica or Gabapentin. But the Lyrica and Gabapentin, they really don't seem to offer anything. The Buspirone, on the other hand, seems to work pretty well. It's non-sedating. It's not a benzodiazepine. You don't develop tolerance. You don't develop dependence on the drug. It doesn't interfere, apparently, with alcohol. And it's effective within several weeks. But the caveat here is if you've used a benzodiazepine previously, chances are the Buspirone's not going to work. Well, then we have the third-line drugs, and the third-line drugs would be a drug like hydroxazine, hydroxazine or Adorax. That's a pretty innocuous drug. We use that oftentimes for people who have itching disorders or people who have hives. They're the tricyclic antidepressants, tricyclic antidepressants like amitriptyline, um, amipramine, dizipramine. Those drugs in some people might be effective. And then there's a big push right now for the atypical antipsychotics. We'll talk about them in a moment. I don't approve of them. Otherwise, we have other kind of drugs. Might be CBD, might be an MAO inhibitor, or prazosin, or clonidine, or propranolol. This is getting way out on the limb. And for some people, yoga or acupuncture is good. And those don't seem to have any harm. Now, unfortunately, as I said, they're pushing the atypical antipsychotics. Those are drugs like Abilify and Seroquel and Zyprexa and Respiradol. These are all basically off-label. And unfortunately, there is a significant problem with side effects. These 50% of the people are going to discontinue the medicines because of either fatigue or because of sedation. And you can have some irreversible side effects because of the drugs. So not really recommended if you're suffering from generalized anxiety disorder. They're also being pushed a lot for depressive disorder right now. Not sure that we have the greatest of evidence that says that those drugs are really good. Well, if you look at the British Medical Journal, talking about the atypical antipsychotics, they say they're not any better than with placebo, but they have a lot of other side effects like weight gain and diabetes and all sorts of other conditions. Actually, the Lancet, 
uh, it's a British medical journal also, in 2019 published a study, and the study was by the Cochrane Group. And the Cochrane Group is just a group that doesn't take any money, that looks at different kinds of medicine, different kinds of conditions. And they looked at the studies on generalized anxiety disorder, and what they said was that 79% of the studies showed high risk or high bias, high risk of bias. 20% had significant issues, and only 1% had low risk of bias. In other words, you could only believe about one out of every hundred papers written, because the other papers, they were tied to drug companies, the people who conducted them were tied to, tied to drug companies, the authors tied to drug companies, the drug companies were the people who set up the protocols, they were short-term studies, they looked at populations that were unrepresentative of the general clinical population that the doctor is going to treat, they have no discussion of the clinical relevance of the findings, all they do is show that the patients improve by so many points on the Hamilton anxiety scale or some other kind of a scale, they tend not to include the harms. And if you're taking the medicine, because remember, we said that the symptoms tend to come and go, how long should you take the symptom? How long should you take the medicine? At what point in time do you stop taking? There are no formal recommendations. And there are no formal recommendations even for adding another medicine if you're taking one medicine and it doesn't seem to be working. When should you add another kind of a medicine? And if you do get better and you're put under social pressure or significant interpersonal conflict, well, then unfortunately the symptoms may tend to recur. So the bottom line is that generalized anxiety disorder, the diagnosis is kind of subjective. We don't have any objective tests to show that that's indeed what you have. Where to draw the line between normal anxiety and pathologic anxiety? Well, a lot depends on your vocalization of the symptoms to the doctor, your personality, whether you're dramatic or whether you're more taciturn. Also has to do with the doctor, his interest and his knowledge of the subject. And often you don't even see a doctor. Often it's a physician's assistant who has even less experience than the doctor. Chances are you're not going to see a psychiatrist with the condition you're going to be treated by the mainstream general practice doctors. So when it comes down to deciding on a treatment for generalized anxiety disorder, we're sort of in a quandary. The medicines that seem to work very well, the benzodiazepines, those are being de-emphasized by the governmental organizations, by international organizations, by professional organizations, because they can cause some problems. Well, they tend to instead say, take the SSRIs, take the SNRIs, but they don't seem to work nearly as well for a significant number of people, and they also were associated with significant problems. You stay on one of those for six months and try to discontinue them. Oftentimes, not so easy. So all of the medicines that we have for this condition, that we don't have any mechanism of diagnosis, other than how do you feel? You anxious? You worried? You tremble, you have some problems with sleep. I don't think that's the way we should make diagnoses. We need something more scientific. And unfortunately, the psychiatric community hasn't really progressed at least as far as the cardiology community or the pulmonology community or the gastroenterologist. So anyway, that's my thoughts. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please tell a friend. Consider subscribing so you'll be notified as we post new videos. I appreciate your interest. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.